In this module, Chemistry Nation, we are getting into chemical reactions finally. So we are, um, you know, looking at breaking and making of bonds. Uh, in the sense of going from starting material to product. So, you know, that's kind of the, the base sense of, of chemical um, reactions, right? Um, we're looking at, you know, chemical change. And we talked about this a long time ago, what chemical change is, right? It's looking at change in structure of molecules going from starting materials to products in breaking and making bonds, right? Not to be confused with the notion of physical change where um, there's no change in you know, the molecule um, we're just looking at changes uh, in state, physical state. So we are focusing in on the chemical side of the equation. Um, and to begin, we need to have an understanding of balancing chemical reactions we have to remember you know according to Dalton right atoms are indestructible So, when we look at a chemical reaction, so the elements you know don't change into different elements. in a chemical uh, reaction, right? So, so realize that we're not what they call transmutation or, you know, some nuclear chemistry. We're talking about chemical uh, reactions or straight up chemistry. Um, so, you know, this means I must have the same number of an element on both the starting material and product sides. And that's the big piece. We must have the same number of an element on both sides of the actual chemical reaction. And so that's where this idea of, you know, balancing and stoichiometry comes from.
And so formally that's called stoichiometry, this idea of the same number. So, so stoichiometry is a number basically that comes before a molecule, and that molecule can be on either starting material or product side that you know relates how much of that molecule is required for a balanced chemical reaction. Right, and it's that number that comes before the molecule. Right, this allows for the number of an element to be equal on both sides. of that reaction arrow. So that's what balancing is, is all about. Let's look at um, an example of this. So when balancing chemical reactions, you know, the first step would be to, you know, start with an element that is, you know, basically present in one molecule on starting material side. and one molecule on the product side. So looking above, we could start with um, carbon or hydrogen with that, with that notion of the relationship, right? Because you know that that has to be the relationship because it's the elements only present in two molecules um, on either side of the, the reaction arrow. Um, right? We would, you know, not or do not start with oxygen since basically it's present in um, two of the molecules on our product side. So once we start to change one, then all of a sudden it changes the other, and, and all of a sudden it becomes like a circular calculation where you're never ever getting to a balanced state. So we don't want to start with the oxygen. We do want to start with our carbon or hydrogen. And so if I, you know, just go maybe slow and stepwise here. I'll start with the carbon. And if I look at my carbon, I have, you know, three carbons on the, the left starting material side, which means up here, right, I need three carbons um, as well. So that's why I'm going to put a three in front of that CO2. So that means my carbons are now balanced. If I go to hydrogen, and now we'll just kind of write this you know, reaction again. I know just being a little bit stepwise here, for our first example, that if we look at our hydrogen here, right, we have eight 
of those hydrogen atoms. And that means we need to have over on the other side, we need to have eight hydrogens as well. So that means we would put a four in front of the H2O. Notice that H2O has two hydrogens in the molecule already. So if I take four times that two, that gives me eight hydrogens. And now my hydrogens are balanced. So if we, you know, just summarize that. in terms of, okay, we know we have three CO2. We know we have four H2O. And so at this point, we have carbon is balanced. We have, you know, our C3H8, right? Equaling the three CO2s in terms of that carbon count. Our hydrogens are also balanced. We have, you know, eight of those hydrogens to deal with. And so that requires four H2Os. And so basically we have now, you know, that equivalence met, you know, three carbons equaling three carbons and eight hydrogens equaling eight hydrogens in terms of, you know, our starting material side and our product side. And so we leave, you know, the elements that are present in more than one molecule on, you know, either the starting material side or product side for last. So if we now look at what we're missing with our oxygen, right? That's the last element that we have to deal with. We have from our three CO2s, we have what, six oxygen atoms. And from our four H2Os, right, we would have four oxygen, or we have a total of 10 oxygen that need to be balanced. So here is where, right, I need to have 10 oxygens um, as well. And so that means I would put what a five in front of the O2. And so now everything is balanced. Our carbons are balanced. We did that with the first step. Hydrogen balance, the second step. And then our oxygen we're saving for last for the third step. And so that is our balanced combustion reaction or balanced chemical reaction. So 
that's how we balance uh, chemical reactions. And, and you might be asking, well, why is it important? Well, right now we have basically a mole to mole conversion, you know, with the stoichiometry. of the balanced chemical reaction. Like if we look above, right, we have, you know, we could say that, you know, one molecule of our propane right is going to, you know, produce three molecules of CO2. And we don't like to tend to deal with molecules, though, right? So, so generally, we go to that next level, which is saying, okay, one mole of propane will produce three moles of CO2, right? It can also produce four moles of H2O and require five moles of O2 for the reaction to go forward, right? So it, it's a it's a mole to mole relationship. So if I combust it basically, you know, two moles of propane, how many moles of H2O would I produce, right? We're really using this reaction now as a conversion feature for us. So I would start with, you know, my measurement. We always start with that idea of the measurement and then convert using that stoichiometry that for every one mole of the propane I would produce three moles of, I'm sorry, H2O. We would be producing four moles of our H2O. So here we're seeing that dimensional analysis here with now going between moles of one molecule and moles of a different molecule. We've done that with elements and molecules going in between them, but now we can do that also between molecules and molecules. And so we would end up with, you know, eight moles of the H2O would be, you know, produced. So that's how we can use that then as a, as a conversion feature. Let's, uh, before we get to, you know, a, a more in-depth example with conversion, uh, you know, using stoichiometry in the conversion process, let's do another example of balancing a reaction. So here we have a reaction with calcium phosphide reacting with uh, water to produce uh, phosphine and to produce uh, calcium hydroxide. So if we, you know, look at, 
you know, where should we begin here? Right, again, just to try to re-emphasize our methodology is, you know, start with uh, an element that, you know, is present in only one Right, and only one molecule on both the starting material and product uh, sides. So if I look above, I could start, you know, with with two of them. Um, calcium uh, would be a good place to to begin, right? Because we only see it. you know, between that and the calcium um, hydroxide. And the other one would be maybe phosphorus um, for the same reason, different molecule, though, as far as the phosphine. So that's where we would want to would start. Um, we could also start with the oxygen, I suppose, but we, we have the hydrogen there in that molecule, too, and that's present in, in two of the molecules. So I'd rather save, you know, that... Um, for last. Right, that also means we're just you know, saving basically the H2O for last. So if I, you know, maybe start a little bit faster here, right? Um, we have our calcium phosphide plus our H2O, right? We would be producing then um, two of the phosphines. Um, and we would then be producing uh, three of the calcium hydroxides. So we have our you know, our three calciums. And so that's where we're getting um, the three then calcium hydroxides on the right. Um, our phosphorus part of that equation is where we get the two phosphorus uh, as well. So that's where we're coming from here, right? We need two, two of those phosphoruses. And then we have the calcium that we're looking to get, and so we need three of the calcium. So now that part is balanced out. We can focus our attention then on the water. So just to kind of reemphasize where we're at and what we're changing as we go forward. or something looks like this now at this point. And if we, you know, calculate how many hydrogens, uh, we would have, you know, six uh, as well as then six from our uh, OH, part of the calcium hydroxide. Um, and, th and it actually looks like it balances out to basically three H2Os. But if we look at our hydrogen count, right, we have six hydrogen there for um, our phosphine from the three and the fact that there are two hydroxides right we have six hydrogens there as well so there's 12 hydrogens 
and then looking at our oxygen, right, we have six oxygens, right, because it also has that, that two there as well. So those are both equal in number. We have the same amount of O as an H in the calcium hydroxide molecule. So that basically comes together, right, to say that we're going to need six H2Os. Right, and so now we have, you know, our our balancing, right, because we would have needed, right, 12 hydrogens, and we would need six oxygens, and so that 6H2O then, uh, uh, you know, accommodates that, that need. So our overall balanced process or the calcium phosphide would be one calcium phosphide plus six H2Os produces two phosphines and three calcium hydroxides. And that is by balanced chemical reaction. So now let's look at how to use chemical reactions or um, and you know it's just really, you know, the idea is going from, you know, an amount. You know, generally we see, you know, a mass, you know, for let's say molecule one. Um, and we get to, you know, moles of that molecule one. Then we go to moles of molecule two, right? And, and that's where the chemical reaction comes into play. So we have, you know, our molecule one, our molecule two, and this is, you know, the reaction that's allowing you to equate those two ideas. And then we can go back to an amount such as a mass now of maybe molecule two. Um, but I want to stress amounts because we have other, you know, types of amounts except, you know, say for mass, you know, we have volume, right? And we have density. And so that's a way to, to get to um, a mass and then mole value as well. So there, there are other amounts, say, for the mass. So we'll do two examples here. One that um, is on the easier side and then one that, you know, um, steps it up um, a little bit. So, so we have chloropicrin here. Um, basically, uh, this is a, an insecticide. And basically, we can, you know, prepare it, you know, by the following reaction. So we're looking at the production of this molecule, uh, chloropicrin. And we start with methyl nitrite. We react that with... Um, chlorine gas and that produces our chloropicrin
as well as then producing HCl. So there are two parts to this. Um, part A is, um, you know, how many grams of the methyl nitrite are required to produce 908 grams of our chloropicrin. So that's part A. Part B, um, how many liters of the chlorine gas um, are needed? Chlorine has a density of 0 0.87 grams per liter but how many liters of chlorine um, are required to produce two pounds of the chloropicrin so those are our two um, parts So if, if we, we start with the beginning, right, here, you know, as far as our first step, we are relating molecules to different molecules. That means we need a balanced reaction in order for that to happen so if we look above it's it's definitely not um, balanced so we need to balance our chemical reaction so bringing that down here we have our methyl nitrate plus our Cl2 gas we're producing our chloropicrin and we are producing HCl so um, if we look at this you know carbon is always balanced already balanced um, right that would be a, an initial point for us because um, it's only in present in one molecule on either side um, Oxygen is balanced. Same idea. As far as our starting point is concerned in trying to balance this process. And it's then the hydrogen that we want to begin with. Right, we have our CH3NO2. And we have that relationship with uh, our HCl. So that's where we want to begin. And that should allow us to get to, um, you know, a relatively balanced process quickly here. If we go up to the top, that means we would have to add, right, we have here three hydrogens, right? So that means we need three hydrogens on that product side. So we would have a three right there. Um, our hydrogens are balanced, carbon's balanced, oxygen's balanced, just the chlorine that's left over now. And so in balancing that part of the molecule, Right, we would need to add, I believe, three. Um, we have 
three hydrogens from the, uh, I apologize, three of the chlorines. from the three HCLs and we have three chlorines from there. So we have a total of six chlorines, meaning we need three. And that would be our balanced chemical reaction. And so now we are balanced. So that is our relationship to each one of, of the molecules. So we can now approach part A, which was asking us, um, you know, grams of the starting material, methyl nitrite, um, to produce uh, 908 grams of the chloro uh, picrin. So it's this, you know, um, same idea of like retrosynthetic analysis that I like to look at, you know, that we need to have a mass of this, uh, I apologize, let's just reverse that mass of the CH3 NO2 is where we're going and we're beginning with a mass of this product. So this is what we have initial. This is what we're trying to figure out in the process. So we can never convert things from mass to mass but what we can do is convert things from moles to moles, right? So we could get into moles of the chloropicrin using the molecular molar mass. And then we can get into moles of the starting material, the methyl nitrite, by using the chemical reaction stoichiometry that we have above from the balanced uh, reaction. We know that one mole of CH3NO2 produces one mole of the chloropicrin. So there is our conversion feature to then get two moles of that desired material, in this case the starting material, and then we can get to mass. So we have you know, our one conversion to get to moles of the material that we are starting with here, the product chloropicrin. Two, we use the chemical reaction that's balanced to convert from one molecule to the other molecule. In this case, our starting material. And then three, we use molecular molar mass again to get to the mass of that desired starting material. So we would start with our measurements, right? And that's always the case, or how I always like to try to break it down as far as an initial point for dimensional analysis. And if we calculate, we should get roughly 164 grams uh, per mole. So we're getting out of mass of that material, getting into moles. We can then use the chemical reaction here now, 
getting out of moles of the molecule, getting in moles of a different molecule. I like to call this the mole to mole superhighway because it's getting you from one place to another, in this case from one mass to another mass. And then now that we're in moles, we can calculate the molar mass for the CH3NO2, which is roughly 61 grams per mole. And so now we've gotten out of the moles of that molecule into grams. And we end up with 337.73 grams, you know, or 338 grams of our methyl nitrite uh, is required. So that is our answer. 338 would be, you know, with respect to, um, you know, sig figs. Our initial measurement is 908 grams. Um, so, so we would uh, curtail that at three. So that's the simpler version of the two, but is really, you know, trying to show you the most important part of this type of conversion, which is the multiple -mole superhighway. The idea that I'm going from the amount of one molecule to the amount of another molecule. I can't do that directly because molecules that are different have different molecular masses. Um, so I can't relate mass to mass. I have to go through you know, the mole conversion because now that's an apples to apples relationship. One mole of one thing is the same as one mole of another. Just like a dozen eggs is the same number or quantity of eggs as a dozen blueberries, right? It's the same, same amount. So that is part A. Part B is definitely getting a little bit trickier here, which was asking us uh, for, um, you know, the gram, I'm sorry, not grams, the volume or liters of our chlorine gas um, needed to produce uh, two uh, pounds of the chloropicrin. And so this is really kind of the same kind of, you know, gambit as far as, you know, initially um, and where we're going uh, is very similar. There's just actually a lot more, more steps, right? Because we have a mass of our chloropicrin initial, and we're trying to figure out something different in terms of not the molecule, but the, the physical unit. Now looking at liters of the chlorine gas. So I should realize again with that relationship of, of you know, relating one molecule to another, Right? It is always a mole game or that mole to mole, you know, super highway. So that means, okay, well, I know I can do that. I know I can go to moles of my chloropicrin. And if I use a chemical reaction, I can get two moles of Cl2, right? In, in terms of, of that balanced chemical 
reaction, right? It was, uh, you know, one mole of the chloropicrin is equal to three moles of the Cl2 that we had above. So there's our conversion feature there. And that can allow me to get to then mass of the Cl2. And so there's our, you know, mass to mass conversion, kind of reinforcing what we did with part A. And so we just have to realize, oh, there's just another conversion here, you know, basically using the notion of density, right, to get from grams to liter, right, or that mass per volume idea. So, so that's um, how we can break out this conversion now into a, a series of steps. So we could start with our measurement again, starting with the two pounds. And we have to be careful here, right? There's really kind of two conversions going on here. Um, if we go up to the top in that first step, because we have to really get to a metric measurement before we can get to the other um, conversions that we actually have. So that's just, you know, looking up, you know, that conversion of, well, one pound is 454 grams. So that allows me to get out of the pound motif, right? That would be our, you know, first conversion. Now getting into the second conversion, we're using that 164 grams, right? The molar mass for the chloropicrin. We're then at that mole-to-mole -mole interface where we have one mole of the chloropicrin for every three moles of the Cl2. So we've gone from, you know, that mass to, to moles of the chloropicrin and now out of moles of that molecule and getting into moles of the Cl2. Here again is the mole to mole superhighway. And then we can multiply by roughly 71 grams per mole to get in terms of you know, grams of the Cl2, and now we can use that density or that fifth conversion to get it in terms of the answer unit, right? We want to get it in terms of liters. There's 0 0.87 grams of the Cl2 for every one liter, right? And that was a density that was given in the actual question. And so we expand that all out, and we get a value of 1.36 times 10 to the third liters of Cl2 is required to produce, you know, that quantity of chloropicrin, the, uh, the actual 2 grams. So that's two examples of showing how we can use a chemical, re chemical reaction. Um, you know, and the balanced process of that chemical reaction, right, the stoichiometry of it, now to relate molecules to molecules, we always have to relate that on a mole-to-mole -mole basis, but now that allows us to go into, you know, lots of conversions. I can start with the volume of a starting material and eventually get to a volume of a product or, or predict the volume of the product. I can go from mass of a starting material and then predict mass of a product, um, or vice versa. Um, so, I want to produce this much product. Well, how much of the starting material do I need? So this is really important process that we use in, in, in putting together chemical reactions and requiring or, or realizing the certain amounts that we are required to utilize for 
a particular conversion or a particular chemical change to um, actually occur. Um, it's just an extra insight into dimensional analysis now, um, combining our ideas of density, molar mass, um, you know, and um, now chemical reaction stoichiometry.